Do you want to find out what the biggest cause of behavioural problems and reactivity across the globe is? Well, if so, join me, Kamal Fernandez, world-renowned dog trainer, in today's episodes of Lifting All Ships to find out exactly what the main contributing factor is. Fernandez here from Lifting All Ships with today's podcast, unraveling the question of what is the biggest cause of <coughs> reactivity issues and behavioural problems across the globe with all dogs. And obviously this is only my opinion and I'm sure other people have their own take on it, but I would say that these two things are probably the most impactful and the most, um, the biggest driving force of why we currently have behavioural problems and reactivity in dogs across the globe. And it's something that I observed um, consistently when throughout my travels uh, in various parts of the world and online and participating in this world of dog training for close to, well, 35 years. And it is something that is definitely a recurring problem when it comes to dogs. Um, and if we evaluate our relationship with dogs and how it came to be, there's a lot of uh, contributing factors as to why we have such a, a, a an epidemic of behavioural problems in dogs, uh, whether it be, be um, things like resource guarding, dogs not coming back when they're called, not doing as they're told, uh, reactivity, whatever you want to call it, there is two major, major things that will ultimately create problems when you own a dog. And they are education and understanding. And it's probably not in the way that you think that it would be. So if we go back in time and we were to elaborate or uh, explore the relationship that we have with dogs, and certainly domestic dogs, and that is probably one of the words that causes the most amount of problems, and it's the concept of domestic dogs. So when we use that word, the instant assumption is that the dogs are going to be domesticated, which means they're going to know what we want of them when we bring them into our homes and we incorporate them into our lives. But therein lies the biggest fundamental issue, which causes a lot of subsequent problems with dogs. Now, now we are to explore the relationship that human beings have with dogs <coughs> and the original purpose for which we created or, or harnessed uh, dogs or wolves or whatever they were um, originally uh, into our lives. It was for essentially to make our lives easier and effectively they were tools. Tools to allow us to make our lives um, more easy, to provide us with food, to help us live our best life, to guard our properties, to deal with vermin and so forth and also to entertain us. Uh, and there's a plethora of um, uh, tasks that dogs were effectively molded or created or designed to fulfill. So if we look at dogs as a, as a species, and we think about the predatory sequence, the, the sequence that dogs or wolves go through when they are looking for prey and they're hunting for prey. Now, that sequence has then subsequently been modified from, for example, the stalking aspect for uh, it, that was originally used to hunt for prey has been modified to create stalking and, and focusing on dogs, uh, sorry, focusing on prey in the form of sheep herding. And we had the, uh, the hunting aspect, which has been, or the seeking aspect, which has been modified to create gun dogs or hounds, which would then seek out, you know, prey, uh, uh, animals that we've uh, killed or, uh, or that have been shot, for example, and they would go and retrieve them and bring them back so we could then consume them and so forth and so forth. If we look at the terrier group, they were exterminators and also they were um, also entertainment in the form of obviously some breeds were within the terrier group were bred for fighting or to um, deal with Bald, for example, uh, Staffordshire Bull Terrier, for example, was a breed that was not only used for fighting, but for also vermin extermination, but also entertainment in the form of um, uh, dog fighting. So they all had original purposes or tasks that were, or activities that they were largely bred 
for or to be um, capable of completing. And a lot of those things is, you know, for example, dogfighting, it's now obviously politically incorrect and illegal in the UK, certainly. And yet we haven't quite modified the original intention for which the dog was bred for to be uh, to live or to function in, to, in, in today's society. Now, what then subsequently happens because we haven't moved our um, expectations of the dogs is that the dogs are behaving in ways which at one point originally served us. And as we move through uh, that chronology of time that has passed um, or, or events, chronology of events that have passed where those dogs were originally, for example, herding, capturing, exterminating, guarding, and so forth and so forth. And now we've modified them where we've got technology which probably takes the place for a lot of those roles, or the necessity isn't there. For example, you know, now rather than having a guard dog, a lot of people will use security systems as opposed to having a dog guard their property. Some people obviously do. Um, and exterminating uh, um, vermin. We would have uh, humane traps or poison or whatever the case may be. So we found ways to t fill those jobs which dogs previously completed for us. Yet, now we've taken those so uh, same dogs or those same breeds and we've put them into situations where often their needs aren't met or substituted for, uh, or accommodated for, I should say. And as a result of that, we have behavioural problems or reactivity issues be the resulting factor. So if we take a breed like the Border Collie, it's one that I know very, very well. I've had them for over 30 years. I've bred them, owned them, you know, and, and competed at the highest level in dog sports with them and had an infinite amount of success with them as a breed. But the breeds that, I, the, the Border Collies that I have are definitely predisposed to traits which, if not harnessed or utilised, would most definitely become problematic. So for example, the first off is their abundance of energy. They're a breed that have been bred to run, you know, an eight, six to eight hours a day, if not more, herding sheep, running up and down hills in the um, uh, in the Cumbrian uh, and Scottish borders, uh, where they've, you know, gone to look for flocks of sheep, which could be hundreds of heads of sheep, and they perform that in really, really difficult terrain and really, really harsh weather um, and circumstances. So they have to have not only an abundance of stamina, they have to a real focus for the task that they're being asked to do. And they have to have somewhat of a uh, an OCD mentality because that task would be performed day after day after day after day. So if we were to look at that animal we were to have it as an, a human being you would have the equivalent of a you know somebody that needed to uh, do a repetitive uh, activity for example a high level sports activity or a, a business person or somebody that was a you know type a personality you have that the canine equivalent in the border collie so when you put that type of dog in an environment where those needs aren't understood or accommodated for you can often see those traits manifesting themselves in a problematic or negative fashion. For example, the border collie that doesn't have a way to express itself physically or mentally will often attach that um, need to things that are unhealthy. For example, the hoover, lights on the ground, movement, anything that moves in the environment, whether it be your kid's scooter or a bike or traffic or just things out the window and so forth and so forth. So we really need to understand the original role for which the dog that you own was bred for. Now, often, certainly with a lot of breeds of dogs or sort of uh, hybrids of dogs or mixture of dogs, we may not know the specific um, breeds involved or the, the, the traits that that dog is predisposed to. But we can certainly unpack some of that um, by making assumptions based on the breed characteristics or traits the dog might exhibit. So for example, if I had a dog with an unknown heritage and it seemed to show uh, an a desire to chase things uh, or it, it was intently staring at things, I would make the assumption or I would draw the, uh, the conclusion that it may have a herding breed in its lineage, which would mean that I would need to accommodate and satisfy that part of its personality. So similarly, if I had a breed that was um, 
that was guarding and woofing and barking at things were in the distance or at night, for example, or was very, very hyper vigilant in new environments and did a lot of scanning, I may draw the conclusion or draw the inference that that dog may have guarding breeds in its um, lineage or working breeds. So it isn't necessarily a definitive, but it can certainly give us an understanding of the dog that we've got in front of us. So firstly, we need to consider the education of that dog. That means it isn't down to the dog to walk into our life and to fit into what we want of them. It's down to us to teach the dog and educate it about what we want of them in all situations. So anybody in the world of dog training, or I would urge everybody to read Jean Donaldson's The Culture Clash, which, Clash, which was a fantastic book which talked about the contrast or conflict between what dogs are and what we want of them to live and navigate a human world. So for example, a breed that might want to chase small furry things, they have to now ignore your cat that lives in your home or the rabbit that lives in your home or your kids that are on scooters. We need to uh, teach them and educate them about what it is that we want them to do in those environments when they are most definitely going to be triggered by that um, motion or some fast moving item or object or thing or animal for example okay so it's really really important that we consider that as part of our commitment to owning our dogs to be aware of what it is that they are and to provide an outlet for them in a healthy safe manner the resulting factor with not doing that is the behavior will still come out, but often displayed in a way that is socially inappropriate or politically incorrect. And the dog is then labeled as aggressive, reactive, over aroused and so forth. And actually it's a dog that's needs aren't necessarily met. We need to be looking at dog ownership beyond just, for example, taking it for a walk, feeding it its meals, providing it with warm uh, accommodation or a nice bed, we need to be thinking about satisfying it on a much more uh, almost primal uh, level, for example. Um, and we need to be thinking about educating ourselves about what is that, sorry, what that dog is originally bred for and the tasks which it will be predisposed to, which could manifest itself negatively. So education is a massive part of it and understanding not only what we have on the end of the lead, but how we can provide activities for them in a healthy way. Now, as a long-term participant of dog sports, my dog's substitute comes in the form of dog sports uh, as a way to appease their natural instincts. So for example, my Border Collies, I use their um, desire to chase to and to fixate on something. To I attach that to me in the form of recall or play, and then that s largely will satisfy that aspect of that their personality or their genetic need. The, my dogs that like to tug things or bite things, I transfer that or utilize play as a way to substitute their most basic need. There is a massive disconnect, I would say, globally with what dogs are and what they, um, what we need them to be. And that really does fall on our shoulders to provide not only substitutes, but educate our dogs. What is it that we expect of them when we bring them into our home? What is it that we expect of them when they're left um, unattended? What is it that we expect of them when they're out on a dog walk and they're off a lead? What is it that we expect of them when they're on the lead and they're walking somewhere? All those things need to be broken down into specific educational points for the dog to be provided um, and to be exposed to over a period of time. Often people make unrealistic expectations of their dog and the timeline for when their dog will be the model citizen and the perfect pet. Um, can often be uh, different from what is realistic of that dog. All dogs mature differently, the bigger breeds are going to be slower maturing, so they can retain and, and maintain a lot of puppy type behaviours or immature behaviours like chewing or um, not being able to settle, loss of recall or just juvenile behaviours far longer than some of the smaller breeds of dogs. So it's really worth doing your due diligence and researching not only the breed of dog that you've got, but the traits or the purpose for which they were originally designed for. So if we think about our role in dog ownership, we have to look beyond just meeting their most basic needs. That means providing for them both emotionally, physically, I talk about the five E's, 
enrichment, exercise, emotional stability, education and entertainment. Those things are, are need to be committed to on a daily basis. So it doesn't just mean that you've taken your border collie for a walk on the weekend and that's going to satisfy them. It means a daily commitment. Now, obviously in today's modern life, a lot of us work long hours, so we need to be thinking a bit laterally about how we can also substitute um, their, substitute those activities in our day that doesn't necessarily draw on our time. So if we think of a, a working dog, um, and a, a, a for which a lot of these dogs were originally um, designed for, so a, a Border Collie or a Labrador or a um, Cocker Spaniel, they were originally bred to do a specific job, and that job would be done on a daily basis for an extended period of time. Now, when we take them out of that role, or we don't provide for them in that set, to that same level or in that same manner, we need to be thinking about our day as a almost a uh, um, an activity uh, process that happens constantly and throughout the dog's day. So that doesn't necessarily mean high level acti uh, energy activity or high level energy uh, high level uh, activity. That means that we need to provide for them mentally. So, for example, you know your dog that likes to hunt, we can use scenting games in the garden or deliver their food in a way that's um, more enriching and more entertaining for them as opposed to just from a metal dish. So we can allocate their food, put it in a cardboard box, put some tape around it and put it in the garden and let them rip that to bits. So that will allow them to rehearse um, that tearing and um, um, dissecting behavior in a healthy way. And it isn't then, you know, items of your clothing or items around your house. So we're providing a substitute for their basic need. We can also think about providing ways that are providing activities that are going to stimulate them uh, mentally that doesn't necessarily require a vast amount of time. So for me, a massive thing to do with dogs is scent work and nose work or searching for items, whether it be food or toy in long grass or toy hidden out in a dog walk as a really, really great way to provide healthy outlets for them mentally, which will also stimulate them physically. So we need to be thinking about doing these several times throughout the day. So I always urge my clients to think about allocating their dog's meals um, throughout the day or, or as a portion and deliver it throughout the day for them. So that way the dog is getting constantly little drip feeding uh, enrichment activities throughout the day as opposed to power napping for you know eight to ten hours and then when the owner comes back from work the dog is all hyped up they're then conditioned to go out for a walk and the dog has then had you know a, a, a very limited amount of stimulation based on the, the the routine throughout the day so think creatively about how you can expel mental energy and physical energy the other thing is to consider doing a dog sport with your dog for me those are great substitutes for a lot of um those basic genetic um, behaviors that your dog is predisposed to, whether it be a cockapoo or a Labrador or a golden retriever, finding a way to provide for them a substitute for their needs, which is more realistic for your modern lifestyle, is a really, really important part of dog ownership. Often when we don't do that, these behaviors can manifest themselves inappropriately. So a lot of gun dogs can display or to can rehearse um, resource guarding because if we think of what they're bred, originally bred for, to go off hunting, grab some, uh, uh, find the, the fowl that's been shot, bring it back or hunt that could be through thick bramble or undergrowth, which again requires a level of commitment and tenacity. They have to hang on to it, bring it back. You know, it could be several hundred meters, if not longer. So that means that the dog has to have a really, really strong desire to want to find it, carry it in its mouth and hang on to it, irrespective of the environment and the distractions. So we would think of that with your pair of socks to the dog that is now it's, it's, um, bird that it's um, going to pick up and the dog is now going to hang on to it because it's in its head the dog is rehearsing that um, desire to possess and hang on to something as long as they possibly can. Obviously a, a gun dog would be trained to give that up in order to receive another um, opportunity to go off hunting again. Often domestic dogs that item is taken off which can create conflict which can result in a uh, an inappropriate response from the dog. So we really need to be thinking about our role in the dog human relationship. 
being sympathetic to the breed that we have created and the various uh, tasks that we once utilized them for, whether it be herding and gathering our potential food, whether it be seeking it out and picking it up after it's been shot, whether it be guarding our property from um, uh, foe or whether it means uh, killing prey within or, or vermin in our homes um, so that they kept us safe and, um, and meant that we didn't get diseases and so forth. Those things need to be substituted in a way that's healthy for the dog and the relationship that you want to have with them. Reactivity is largely down to anxiety and apprehension, but I would say on par with that would be lack of um, substitutes for the dog's DNA or the dog's genetic needs, I should say. Um, and that can then manifest itself in ways that are politically incorrect. So the terrier that has at one point been sent to go down a, uh, a badger a set or to, to bark at prey or to locate them and then grab at them and, you know, effectively kill them or exterminate them to alert their owners to where the rats were, the mice were, and then as soon as they they um, start to move, grab them and then shake them and kill them effectively. Um, when we take that same dog and take it to the park and where there's another dog or something that moves fast, that's going to trigger that same response. So we need to give that dog education and alternatives for that same genetic need, but in a healthy way. Again, scent work, toy play, stimulus control, impulse control, are all going to be things that we can incorporate into that dog's life to make sure that the dog is safe, it's socially appropriate, and it's a joy to own. So for me, a massive part of dog ownership is understanding what I'm signing up for. My good friend Denise Frenzy says to, uh, talks about training the dog in front of us, and that is also for me applicable to the behavioural side, making sure that we are meeting that dog's needs. And often, the behavioural problems that I see is the disconnect, and the, the, the disconnect really about what dog ownership is. For me, a massive part of dog ownership is meeting the dog's needs emotionally, physically, in terms of its welfare and providing it with, um, you know, whatever it needs in terms of veterinary care and so forth, but also making sure that I meet the dog's needs um, on a more basic level. My border collies need to rehearse herding. For my dogs, it's herding each other or herding me in the form of games. Um, my dogs that like to hunt and sniff, I provide that, uh, an outlet for that via searching games or scent games and so forth and so forth. So we need to really understand what dogs are and what they originally were bred for and be fair to them while we go through. It's almost like our life has moved far quicker than our expectations of dogs has um, a lot hasn't aligned with that that um, movement or that that point now. So, for example, um, dogs that. Uh, at one point they were so and you know but it wasn't that long ago that there was a lot of uh, dogs used as working animals or, or tools on a daily basis but as we've moved into a more modern world where as I said earlier technology and machinery has taken the role of those um, animals we need to um, understand and be compassionate to the fact that we haven't necessarily been realistic and fair that we've moved the goalpost and we haven't necessarily given the dogs the same timeline to uh, to change or to modify their gut instinct or their natural instinct. Obviously there is always this section, exception to the role. You could have the Jack Russell Terrier that is really docile and laid back and doesn't show any interest in uh, chasing things or reacting to things. We could have the Border Collie that, that's the same, you know, super laid back, not interested in chasing or in not interested in movement. But I would say that those dogs are the exception to the rule. And if they were in a farm or in a, a, a working role, they would probably be uh, weeded out of the gene pool. Bearing in mind that because of the original purpose for which dogs were created or breeds were created, there is a longer uh, history of them being used for those jobs than there is from the timeline of them not being used for those roles. And we need to understand that, you know, the genetics and the, the DNA that has been uh, created or with, is it within them is far more predisposed to those traits than not. So uh, hypothetically, what we would need to do is almost modify those breeds and dampen down those instincts and substitute them uh, for other instincts or other traits and that would take some time to to almost 
uh, eradicate the Border Collie's desire to herd or to eradicate the Terrier's desire to hunt or the Spaniel's de uh, desire to um, pick things up and hang on to it. But then we, we need to also be fair and going, well, are we actually being fair to what the breed is and what the dogs are? Uh, and are we being realistic about our, our the fact that we have effectively created our own um, problem? So for me, understanding and education, not necessarily for um, the dogs, but from our point of view. Do we understand what we're signing up for? Do we understand what that dog was originally bred for? Have we educated them how we want them to live in our human world? Have we provided substitutes for those behavioural traits that they are predisposed to and their genetic needs that they are hardwired to seek out? It's really important that we understand that when we're getting a dog and often you'll find that there's that disconnect and what people want of dogs is them to slot into their lifestyle where they can walk loosely on the lead, come back and ignore all other dogs but still be really really social uh, but not too social where they're inappropriate but then be chaseable but then not chase it excessively to alert um, them to strangers but not then um, alert them when the postman or the Amazon man comes and does the delivery and you can see how we, we've got to be fair to our dogs. Often we'll find that uh, what you'll find is what we are expecting of them is unrealistic. They, they, you're asking almost for them to to meet a, a standard that is almost impossible. So they have to um, have the perfect balance of being the guarder but not um, wanting to bite the postman, to chase a ball but not obsess about the ball, to uh, lie down quietly when we have strangers but also guard my house from strangers and you can see how it's really unfair sometimes of the expectations we have of dogs. So I urge everybody to think about those points, education and also understanding. Do you understand what your dog is made for and predisposed to and have you educated them to live in this not so dog friendly world that we live in? It's really important that we take that responsibility on our shoulders because therefore the power to create the dog that we want to own is very much in our hands. I hope you found this episode of Lifting All Ships interesting. If you do, please hit the subscribe button to make, get notified of all future episodes and let me know what you think. For me, Kamal Fernandez, take care, be safe and enjoy your dogs.